is Mark for the beginning of it. Hey, Mark, how you doing? You're on live with us. We had a little technical difficulties there to begin on with, so <laughs> you're on with myself and Gary Brown. Gary, say hi. Good evening, Mark. How are you, sir? I'm well. Hi, Gary. Good. So, nice to virtually meet you. <laughs> virtually meet everybody. Yeah, that's good. So Gary's broadcasting over in the UK, and we switched the time front to uh, four to six here on my side because it makes it nine o'clock to eleven o'clock. My original was actually show time, but Gary, you know, with anybody would have a little trouble getting up at three o'clock in the morning for this crap. Oh so yeah, yeah. It's good. <laughs> switch it. So welcome to the show, and uh, really glad to have you because a lot of people put stuff out on the internet that is controversial and then you can never get a hold of them to right. interview them and stuff like that. So I'm really glad that you, you decided to come on with us. So, uh, why don't you tell us, uh, Mark, you know, how you, uh, cause we had talked about this before. How did you, uh, come about this flat earth theory? Because it is an extremely unusual thing because uh, when I, I first heard it, I was like, Oh, come on now. And <laughs> here's some NBA players. They're getting bashed for it and everything like that. So, Go ahead. Tell me how you how you discovered this, and and you know what's your belief system in it. Sure, sure. I got into this at well, actually just looked at it in, in the middle of 2014. So like the summer of 2014, I was uh, what I would like to call conspiracy bored. I had gone through just about every conspiracy you could think of, knew and heard. Just about, I had my opinions on pretty much everything. And I had, it was like, all right, I'll look in the, you know, the, the distant little corners of the internet and see what that's out there. And everybody, everybody knows about Flat Earth. Everybody's heard about this since we were kids and we all hate it. And it's like, oh, it's a piece of crap. You know, and, and I just, I don't know what compelled me, but there was a German guy that uh, I think his YouTube channel was called Cesar. And, and the, the video was all in German. And he was talking about how the flight paths in the Southern Hemisphere didn't make any sense. And I'm like, I'm going through it, and I'm looking at the subtitles, and I'm going, yeah, yeah. And he's going, it only makes sense if the map looks like this. And he, and he was showing the, the Flat Earth map, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. Not sure I buy it, but it, it was enough that I went and clicked on another one. And there was not a lot out there in 2014. Uh, I clicked on another one by a Canadian guy who was talking that about how he had gone to a NASA party years ago and that during this discussion over wine and candlelight because the power had gone out that, uh, that the gps system didn't work down in antarctica because it was flat and the the one of the mucky mucks there would was drawing in chalk on the floor how the world looked what it looked like and all the thermal dynamics and how the energy transfers worked and i was going you know what this is you know it started to i, I won't say like a spidey sense thing but it was like you know what I'm going to I'm going to see if I can knock this thing out. I still didn't believe it, but I think figured like anybody's like I at least I can try to debunk it. I should be able to knock it out over a weekend. Fast forward about 9 months. <laughs> me just banging my head on the keyboard going, "Why can't I prove the globe anymore?" Every time I think I get close, I you know, there's threads that are going off into different directions to where finally uh February 10th of 2015, I decided as like a, a last desperate cry for help. I made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues, which was basically just, I, you know, I, I consider myself, I, you know, I, I was trained in, in the tech, the tech field, I spent most of my career in the tech field, training people, and, and I was a hell of a bug tester, creative problem solver. For whatever reason, I could not solve this riddle of why I couldn't shut down Flat Earth completely. So I made the videos and I put them out on the internet, put them on the YouTube and, and uh, didn't really have any YouTube videos out and said, okay, here's what I think is going on. Here's, here's my problem with the globe right now. I flipped. I went to the other side. I go, I don't think it's a globe anymore. Here's my reasons why. And they were real generic. You know, a lot of connect the dots and no real math and the original clues and put it out there and honestly as god is my witness thought that someone in the academic field you know some astrophysicist or astronomer would call me up or leave me a message and say okay here's where you went wrong you forgot to carry the two here it's all a bunch of crap you can shut down your youtube channel now and the exact opposite started happening to where i had subject matter experts calling me up from various uh, places in the military and engineers and and everyone tied to, to flight uh, and then people started interviewing me going, hey, you know what, this is, this is some pretty interesting stuff. It's like it, what I had done was, just to be clear, 
I didn't invent flat earth. You know, I didn't and anyone out there before me, they didn't. Flat earth's been around for a long, long time. What I did was I just created the dummy's guide for it. I boiled it down to such simple, easy to digest pieces that for whatever reason, it, it seemed to gain traction and it helped people. So they, they read my stuff and then they went backwards and they said, then they started looking at other people who had been working on it in, you know, 2014, 2013 and looking at their stuff because their stuff was, was pretty good, but it wasn't, it, it was like a, you know, a third level, third year university type stuff where it was mine was basically 101. So that's how I got into it. I like 101. It yeah, me too. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, uh, so I pulled up a site, flatearthsociety.org. Are you um, no that no? Is a, okay. Here's the weird part. When I first got into this, because again, there was not a lot of uh, things you could lean on for material. I actually joined one of the flat earth societies just to see what it was like, and I said in my clues, it was really strange because there were dedicated trolls that were just hanging out at the front door of this place, chasing people away constantly. Like, you know, like, oh, there's nothing to see here. Move along, move along. Well, why would you, there's only like 500 people in this whole little club there. Why are you doing this? And so when I, I then I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do my own thing. I mean, social media, as you know, <clears throat> can bypass a lot of stuff. So I stayed completely away from the flatter societies and I did uh, more or less just, just, just YouTube. And that's what everybody else, when they, you know, all the other people in the community started going, they were like, you know, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the other stuff that I don't use. So basically social media has outpaced all the flat earth society stuff. In fact, I had a call finally, I think it was early of 2017, where uh, like one of the new presidents of some flat earth society called me up and said, said, you know, they were offering their support. And I was going, uh, no offense, but where have you guys been? I mean, they literally were completely hands off. They were completely content being this tiny, tiny fringe. And so when I really, it's the new community, the, the social media flat earthers that have really set this thing on fire to where now it's like, I don't, we, what, we, did, we did the conference, the national conference last year and nobody in, not only nobody, none of the presenters, but I didn't even meet anyone at the conference. And there were hundreds of people there that were even part of the society. So they can they can do what they want. They uh, they're not going to be any help to us at this point. Okay, so I'm looking at some of the people were asking about uh, flat Earth maps and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, on a flat Earth map, it's believed that the North Pole is the center of the the flat Earth. Right. You want me to describe and, that? And um, because I'm looking at the map, like the UN map, and I pulled up some of the different maps. Modern day flat Earth map. You have the uh, Orlando Ferguson map. Yep. Yep. You have the uh, Port Portland map. Uh, all, all kinds of different maps. Right. Um, and all of them show the North Pole being in the in the center. Right. Um, so my question is, with that, why why is the North Pole in the center? I guess because it's the center. It would it would be considered everything goes to the to the center. I guess. But yeah. Why do we need a magnetic North Pole? Because it, it, in some ways, uh, I'm just – I am not a scientist. Sure. I am not a uh, – you know, I do good in science, I guess, but not <laughs> a scientist. So let me ask you. So what is in the center to make it magnetic north? Mm. Is there a – I mean is there something there that dr make, makes magnetic north? Because uh, – I mean say all the ley lines going to the center and stuff like that to there. Right. But it, it – it, Explain to me why it's in why sure. the North Pole is magnetic center of this of this flat Earth. So yeah, it, you know, that's a good question. And the, to rephrase it, if you were going to build a flat world, why would you even have to make a magnetic North? Why sure. why even why? Ha why even have it there? Uh, which is interesting, by the way, and I have to preface this, which is I, I thought was fascinating when I found out because this guy called me a guy from uh, Australian military intelligence. And he says, you know, what's stranger is that when you go south, because if you're looking at the outer edge, it's like, OK, where's magnetic south? And the, the guy from Australia goes, there is no magnetic south. It's the running joke down there. He, because it's one of those questions we, we learn as kids up here in the north. It's like, well, what happens, you know, because all the compasses here point north. How far 
south do you have to get before they before south becomes the dominant force you know it should be like pretty close to the equator you would think or somewhere around there and he says it never happens he goes he goes you're down in the sorry i'm sorry say it again compasses but compasses don't point north they they point north and south i yeah don't just point to north (laughs) well no no i i get that i I get that but he said but i'm saying that south never becomes the dominant force it's it's always it's not it's not at all and, and look i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna be the devil's advocate mark okay so you're probably gonna hate me by the time this interview's done that's okay oh, we already hate you come on <laughs> south isn't a dominant force north isn't a dominant force they're equally attractive yeah both Go- north gotcha. and, and the south pole all right that that's fine that's fine let me answer the the other question then if okay. as far as why would you make uh the north pole a magnetic force to simulate a globe basically uh, this place was not designed and we again to clarify we had nothing to do with the building of this place lots of people will say well you know our older our ancestors and us they wouldn't have the technology to build this place no no this this place is far far older than us we're talking about a giant version of the truman show that could be hundreds of thousands of years old could be millions of years old we don't know but as far as putting the the North Pole at the center of the map, it works pretty well because at that point, you know, if you're sailing around the world, compass works just fine. You know, it, it, everything everything checks out, but it also works fine on a flat map, meaning if you run your circle around a dinner plate, technically you have circumnavigated the dinner plate, although that doesn't make the dinner plate a sphere. And by, and by the way, I have to also have to say that sphere, globe, ball are the, are the terms we use. Anyone that says round, it's like, well, yeah, round's fine, but it also could apply to a two-dimensional thing. So when people say that the, they believe the earth is flat and not round, it's like, no, 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 no. technically it's flat and round, just so you know. Well, that's cool. I just wanted to just, just for a go on, because I don't want people to think, and I don't want you to think, Mark, that I'm, I'm just going to bash you for two hours. Um, what, what we do as a show is like um, show us tell us explain it you know we don't want to get people on and ask them what their favorite tv program is so bring on your theories believe what you want but back it up so that's what we're after yeah? okay. so when i throw sort of arguments at you it's not because i'm trying to trip you up or be funny it's because i want you to clarify where you're coming from sure okay? sure sure totally understand brilliant yeah it's interesting because it in, in... For people who haven't looked into it, there is the belief in the Flat Earth Society that there is a – the sea, I, I may be wrong in this because I've read a bunch of different articles. Mm-hmm. The seas are held in place by a wall of ice around the entire uh, globe or whatever you want to call it, right, around right, right. The, the Flat Earth. So there is a wall of ice that basically encases, you could say. Or right. would that be the edge of the of – the, would that be like the – it's the be- edge of the dome. It's the no, no, no. It's the beginning of the edge. So the wall, okay. the wall of ice, and I hate using that term only because the the Game of Thrones has been doing its thing now for a few years, and everybody knows about the wall. You know that that big wall of ice. But the Antarctic coastline is interesting from that standpoint. And what we mean is, yeah, the, the water's not going anywhere. All those pictures of, and those pictures were way before us, of, uh, you know, the cosmic waterfalls where there's this flat disk in space where the water's going off the edge. And people love using that. It's like, no, 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 there is no space. It's just a flat disk sitting on something much larger, which we don't know. You know, it could be a freaking terrarium, a petri dish, uh, a snow globe sitting on somebody's desk. Uh, but there's there's no sp- there's no space to th- to speak of. And as far as how the water's held in, yeah, the Antarctic coastline, if you get out there, is unique as opposed to any other coastline. Uh, it rises up you know, 150, 200 feet straight up ice. It's really tough to find a beachhead, and, and I mean they're out there, but not a lot of them. And then when you get on top of it, then it starts sloping up uh, pretty rapidly to where most of the continent sits at about 14,000 feet, which is just screams go away since altitude sickness starts kicking in at about 7,000 feet. And it wraps all the way around. So yeah, it, for those of you who are trying to visualize this, Antarctica is not a continent shaped similar to Australia. It is a continent that's much much more vast and it circles this entirely and as far as the distance between the beachhead and where the outer marker is 
where where the beginning of the barrier starts, the dome, whatever you want to call it. It's got to be thousands of miles at that point because they were looking for it with aircraft pretty much nonstop from 1928 up until Admiral Byrd's last mission, which was in 1956. And that's, of course, when they locked Antarctica down forever. So um, my question is, <clears throat> with that with that thought is um, – if I fly east, mm -hmm. there, there, was, there was one guy that said, well, if you fly east and you keep going east, okay, mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're on a globe, you're going to come back around and end up right where you were, but you're going to be coming from the west. Right. Now, is that, that what could not be true with a flat earth? Because if I went directly in a straight line across, I would eventually run into the wall. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the compass, the... Everything except north, you kind of pretty much got to throw out because what is southeast and west on the outer edge? If you could bypass GPS, if you could get away from it, you know, the United States uh, military system. I mean, if you looked at, if you followed the sun, so rise in the east and sets in the west, that's a constant every day. It right. never changes. Rise right. say, so if I, if, if I flew towards the, set, towards the rising sun and flew away from the setting sun and did that same thing with the moon, it's, it's – goes on the same trajectory. If I did that and just tried to circumnavigate, I would wouldn't circumnavigate. I would run into a wall sooner or later. Uh, not actually. It's funny because the way you put it is is different from anyone else that has put it that way. Because no one else I've ever talked to has said, "Well, what if I follow the sun?" And you couldn't even follow the sun because in our model, uh, similar to I'm trying to visualize this for you guys over the radio, similar to the yin yang symbol the sun and the moon follow a circular path above this thing and they're very very small so if you followed the sun literally you'd be like following a rabbit around a dog track you'd, you'd eventually come back around you'd have to bypass that <clears throat> as well the only way you could reach the edge is if you had a pilot and enough fuel and just boy i don't even know what the best way to do it would be you'd, you'd have to ignore everything and i, I don't put it on cruise control straight uh, well even cruise controls is tied to now nowadays all cruise control if the, the aircraft is advanced enough is tied to the gps system i mean unless you're in a really really small plane that doesn't have advanced electronics uh so but yeah if you could do that eventually you would run into you you'd reach the coastline of antarctica and if you had enough fuel you would eventually reach the outer marker, which, of course, is why you're not allowed to run amok in Antarctica, and the Antarctic Treaty is so rock solid. But Antarctica would be um, to the south of us. It's it, 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 in this map. So in this map, it's west. in all it's in all directions, and there, it, it, okay. no matter which way you go, if you could make it in a perfectly straight line from any any heading, eventually you would run into the Antarctic coastline. So you're you're in your model. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've mentioned the sun and the moon. Yeah. Now, modern um, scientific thinking is that the sun is it's about 1.4 million kilometres across, right. and it's about 150 million kilometres away from us. Right. What what is it in your model? You say it's a lot closer and a lot. Oh smaller. God, yes. Uh, yeah, the Aristophanes thing, unfortunately, is limited because yeah, I'll use. I know you're going to use kilometres. I'll use miles. So yeah. uh, main, mainstream yeah, science. I, I, miles, thank you. Well, no, no worries. <laughs> so main, <laughs> mainstream science is the the sun is ninety three million miles away, and the moon is two hundred and thirty seven thousand miles away, and they're both yeah. both much much bigger. The the moon is two thousand miles wide, and the sun is whatever it is, hundreds of thousands of miles wide. What we're saying is they're both pretty much right above us and just tiny. Uh, in relation to each other. So they would be both, I don't know, less than 50 miles wide, but they may only be a couple thousand miles high. But And that still would work out fine because, again, as long as perspective would still be fine there, meaning that it's closer, but it's kind of like it's the argument. I know people are going to have a hard time visualizing this, so let me let me do a simple one. If you're holding a pen, we've all done this as kids, you're holding a pen really, really close to your eye, right? Is that pen really close to your eye, or is it just really, really, really big? That's what we're mm -hmm. talking about here. Uh, human beings... We're talking about perception. Perception. Human beings have a horrible... Uh, and, and you can look at the scientific studies on it. Horrible uh, per perception abilities, not just with uh, uh, size of objects that are of generic shapes, 
but of speed, relative speed. So yeah, in our model, the sun and the moon, again, like the yin-yang symbol, very, very small, circling around each other, you know, basically chasing each other around this disk, uh, you know, of different speeds, because eventually you can get an eclipse and not an accident that the moon fits perfectly in front of the sun. It's like, oh, well, it's because it's 400 times more narrow, but it's 400 times closer. And it's like, or they could be the same size and right above us. And that's the one we're going with. Well, I'll, I'll just say um, one of the many reasons why your model fails. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we see the sun rise and set. If it was in your model, we would see it constantly. Even if it's, if it's strong enough to cast the light on us and the radiation that it does, mm -hmm. we would see it move around the sky, not disappear below the horizon. And I know you're going to say perspective. Oh, it's all perspective. It disappears out of view. It doesn't. It goes down the, on the horizon. It gets bigger. It appears bigger to us due to atmospheric lensing. Mm, yeah. And then it disappears below the horizon. In your model... If I was to stand on a higher building and look through a powerful enough telescope, I should still be able to see the sun and the moon. So can you explain that? Sure. <laughs> Atmospheric lensing perspective. Uh, look it up if you get a chance. And again, we're not going to be able to do it justice. I don't, I don't need to look it up, Mark. I don't need to look it up. Uh, hey, you don't that's want to believe. That's right. fine. I'm not here to convince you. I'm not even here to persuade you. I'm just here to let you guys know what's happening out there. And this thing's gotten more traction than I don't even know what to do with. Uh, no, that's cool, Mark. I, I mean, you're, you're here to say why it is, and I'm here to say why it isn't. Oh, so I got you. No, 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 no. I, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. You don't want to look it up. That's fine. If you want to be I happy, you to. want to be happy with the globe, you can hang on to it for as long as you can. But in the end, it's, it's not just that. What we have to do is correlate evidence scientific evidence that is checkable by ourselves, not just what we're told on YouTube and on TV programs, mm -hmm. science that we can check ourselves. Now, I was in the Navy. Scott was in the Navy. We have seen ships disappear below the horizon bottom first so that just the mast is appearing. Now, the only model that works on is a globe model. If it's perspective, I should be able to pick up my binoculars and see again clearly. I can't. It's disappeared out of sight. Yeah. Um, so the Fata Morgana effect, that never heard of it. Doesn't, doesn't mean anything to you. How the blurring effect, how that boats when they go over actually don't go whole first. It's just a distortion that starts layering up and up and up until where it finally just disappears off in the horizon. If I, 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 I could, let me throw this at you real quick because people yep. because you said scientific stuff fine and i had someone recently come to me and they said oh look we got a professor of astrophysics from georgetown university he'd like to mm -hmm. he'd like to debate you can you come up with five quick scientific question things you know not fill in the blanks not connect the dots not nothing based on faith five scientific things you could throw at him and uh we recorded it and i sent him these five things let me rattle them off to you real quick long yeah, distance sure. long distance photography uh, and they're, they're quick questions, so bear with me. How long do we have till the first break? Oh, don't worry. Just go. Okay. You're fine. You're fine. You're good. Okay, so long-distance photography. The mainstream science formula for the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared. An easy comparison would be fo the falling rate of 32 feet per second, per second. So 8 inches per mile per mile. 2 miles is 2 times 2, which is 4 times 8 is 32 inches. 3 miles is 3 times 3 is 9, or 8 is 72, and so on. At 50 miles, the curvature should be 50 times 50 times 8, coming in at over 1,600 feet. And yet, with HD cameras, we can pull boats back into frame that are well beyond visual range. Not only does the new technology clearly show that it's not a mirage, but the same objects can be viewed in infrared and can be targeted ship to ship by beam radar. Can science explain this? That's just one of five questions that I, that I threw at people. And the second he got that question, the guy folded like a card table and the debate was over. He... He, he was, didn't agree to have it aired. He didn't want to have anything to do with the project after that. So basically, Phantom Morgana is a mirage. It's, it, it is, but it's, but it is, it is kind of like a mirage, but it only happens uh, when the atmosphere is hot, uh, most concentrated above the water. 
uh, and and usually, and it really really helps with warm weather. You get the that weird blurring. In fact, that's what's really fun for us is that we've now noticed that in cold weather, the the, the Fata Morgana has almost disappeared entirely, and we've shot over ice at distances that, I mean, literally at point blank, where you put the camera on the ice and the light source on the, on the ice on the other side, and we can always see it, and there's, there's no distortion. Of course, people don't like going out in cold weather, but it works. Let me, let me rattle off real quick for you guys, uh, just because I know, I know you've, you've seen the clues, but since the clues have come out, I've had different people from different disciplines who have called me. Uh, who have said, you know, hey, look, I think you're onto something. Here's the list of, and I've got them all recorded on on my channel. You guys can listen to it if you want. Uh, just what is your channel? Uh, oh, name? it's it's just my it's just my name, Mark Sargent. Okay. Uh, and when I'll you there, there, there's a playlist there called Subject Matter Ex, or, I'm sorry, Testimony Shows by Subject Matter Experts. These are all the guys unsolicited who contacted me, and you know, I verified all of them. And they all said the same thing, but let me rattle them off. United States, United States Navy missile instructor, Air Force navigator, Marine Corps sniper instructor, Navy submarine chief, Army artillery radar operator, Australian intelligence officer, American flight instructor, an industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals, a career surveyor of 32 years, international shipping expert, corporate travel agent, air traffic controller, United States Army master gunner, aviation and ground training combat experts, USDA surveyor of 27 years, 32nd degree mason, for whatever reason, etheric science researcher, commercial airline ca captain, co-pilot, industrial vacuum expert, merchant marine, Army air traffic controller, U.S. Navy quartermaster, and then a guy I had a few weeks ago, United States Navy electronic warfare. They've all told me the same thing, which is, yeah, we've heard about the curvature. We all hear it in our training. We all, we all hear about the Coriolis effect and the spinning of the earth. We don't use it in practical applications. So you know about the Coriolis effect? I would hope so after three years, yeah. Well, that's, that's what I can't understand why you can just rubbish the Coriolis effect when it is responsible for the Earth's magnetic field. It's responsible for the Earth's weather systems, for the fact you see your water running down your plug hole of your bath a certain way in the northern hemisphere and different in the southern hemisphere. Mm. I mean, that is the basis that this Earth does it, and it's checkable. Mm. Who, who, who's, who, who told you the Coriolis effect was, was the basis of all these things? Mainstream science? The same guys that told you that the core of the earth was this molten ball of metal? The same guys? Well, I'm more, I'm more likely to believe checkable physics than I am a group of people who are just saying it's all man-made. You know, the Coriolis effect is a mathematical equation that the earth on the equator spins faster than the earth at the pole. And yet that mathematical so equation is never used by any of these people that are firing projectiles. Not the army guys, not the missile guys, not even the sniper guys, even though mainstream news will tell you, oh yeah, this guy used the curvature of the earth formula. Really? Because my Marine Corps sniper guy says it's never ever used. And I shoot. And the scopes have two things on it, windage and elevation. There is no... Because it's, only, it's because it's only oh. over about a thousand yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The but it, effects happens over hundreds of miles. Uh, the artillery guys shooting five, th three, 30 miles. The missile guys are shooting 50 miles. The torpedo guys are shooting 30 miles. The Coriolis effect should be factored in, and they're not. There is no not Coriolis effect. That it, not to the extent that it would. That will explain how hurricanes spin... Um, at counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. I don't know. Why? I'm not. I'm not saying that there aren't magnetic forces out there that are being used. I'm saying they're completely artificial. All the world's a stage, as Shakespeare said. You're in a giant building, huge building, and up until now, we didn't even have the technology to detect it. Literally, up until the 1950s, we had no idea where we were. We just had to believe science. Remember, that. don't forget that science put that globe out there 500 years ago, but they literally did not have the ability to actually go up and take a picture of it. All they had was the equations you spoke of until 1958 when NASA was formed. And so the question becomes, well, if you finally do go up high enough to take the picture and it's not what you think it is, or you can't even reach that high to take the picture, which is probably the case, do you tell the public? No, no, you do not. It's... Well, actually, it was the, the 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 globe Earth theory was postulated in about 276 BC by a Greek called Eratosthenes. 
who worked out from shadows shining. He had a, a well in his village, in his city, rather, that on a certain time of year, the sun was directly overhead and it shone down to the bottom of the well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, the, the sticks and shadows argument, I know it very well. Yeah. But if and that... He, and if, he actually formulated the diameter of the planet from those equations, from, from geometry, oh. which geometry actually means Earth measurement. That's where it comes from. It, and he... He was pretty much spot on with the diameter of the Earth to what we say it is today. <laughs> or we just corroborated what we wanted to. If his theories were so widespread, then we can just throw out the Copernican models. I mean, in fact, we might as well go to the libraries right now and start burning books on Copernicus. Because that would be redundant, wouldn't it? Aristosthenes... If you want to go back a couple thousand years, that's fine. Copernicus was when it really started kicking in. Yes. And my point is when they got to the they got to that stage where it's like, hey, you know, someone should really go up there and actually confirm what we've been saying in math for a long time. Uh, you know, it, I'm saying it wasn't the case. And don't I, let me let me quote Neil deGrasse Tyson here. And one of the reasons yep. I get I get so passionate about this is is statements from this like this from science, which is he said science is true whether or not you believe in it. Well, you want to tell me the boiling temperature of water at sea level? That's one thing. You want to tell me about other things? Boy, you you better be sure. Uh, for example, uh, Kelvin, Lord William Kelvin, you know the the father of thermodynamics. Absolute temperatures are named after him. You know, big big yep. monkey muck. Everybody uses his name every day in, in physics departments, and yet he was the same guy. That, remember, before he died in 1900, he said that yeah, airplanes never going to be a thing. Aeronautical society, absolutely useless. It is never going to happen. And before he died, there's airplanes. And then popular mechanics, even in 1910, popular mechanics is saying, yeah, there's no future in air aircraft at all. So... Well, we also believe that back in the 19... Back in 1910 or 1911, when the shark attacks were happening on the Jersey Shore, that the Smithsonian Institute in America said that sharks do not attack men. They're afraid of them. That mm -hmm. came directly from the Smithsonian when all these shark attacks were happening. Now, people in Australia, they were they came up to try to help to, to help at the Jersey Shore, and they said, dude, let me ask you, you jump in the water with a shark, it's going to eat you because they, they had experienced it. So different experiences have different theories sure. because they couldn't prove anything different. Sure. But I think that we're kind of getting into oh. an area of let's argue math, let's argue this and that. I have a question for yes. you with with all the stuff that, that we've looked at. Now I've lo I've looked at the the flat Earth um, map and stuff like that. Yeah. So we have lots of pictures taken from satellites. We have pictures taken from the International Space Station. We have pictures taken from actually from cosmonauts who were actually up and went outside their their capsule and took photographs of the earth mm -hmm. and the one thing they never that i never see is that i think if i'm looking down at at the the earth i would see the earth in the model that that is on the map where you would see the the um the north pole in the center with yeah. everything coming out from it mm -hmm. in that way but i never see it that way the only thing i ever see is the north at the top the south at the bottom and you're kind of going around the axis almost like the equator right. area right so you don't see that so what what why would you? Why is that happening? Oh uh, boy! That just, uh, where where do I? I mean, I, I I mean, I think the theory is that we're being fed these things, but it, there's been people like back in a long, long time ago. I mean, how long is this? I mean, are all these people that go up there are they all part of a pond that that basically? It's it's, it's yeah. In some ways, okay. And I and I know we're not going to be able to cover all of it in the show, but that's fine. No, no, uh, no. So no, the, I, I just thought I'd ask. Na, no, it's all right. So NASA's formed in, in 1958. And in uh, 1959, you know, they announced the, the Van Allen radiation belts. That's neither here nor there. We could get into that later. Uh, the first picture, I, I mentioned that because the first picture of Earth, the, the first blue marble shot, and you can look this up if you get a chance, uh, was announced and released in 1972 from Apollo 17. The, the last mission, forget about Apollo 9 through 16, you know, went to the moon and back, you know, and, and nobody took a picture of, uh, they literally waited till the last possible moment, then took a blue marble shot. And that literally was the only full disc shot of Earth ever taken. 
uh, well, was was taken for 43 years. And we know this because after we started ramping up in 2015, in the summer of 2015, in fact, I'm looking at the link right now, but it was released at whitehouse.gov on uh, 720, which was, oh yeah, by the way, we have a new blue marble shot. And, you know, Obama comes out and it's like the first blue marble shot, 43 years, you know, that's a terrible impression, but you know where I'm going. And it's like, okay, what took you, like you were saying, with all the different things that are flying up there, why did you wait 43 years to take another shot of the earth? It's because they were too worried about how they were going to fake it. And the shot that they released in 2015, in the summer of 2015, was, was terrible. It was just awful. So everything that has been taken from NASA, and yes, what I'm saying, I know it's going to upset a whole bunch of people there because i'm saying it's it's that line from mission impossible no no it's worse than you think i'm saying that the only reason nasa was created was to keep this thing under wraps for as long as possible meaning militarized space uh the, it, because think of it this way if you're going to take that picture in 1972 here, here's where it gets weird you can't just take the picture you can't just hand the picture to people because what's the question they're going to ask they say well how did you take the picture you actually have to at least simulate or create a technology that has the appearance of going high enough to take the picture most expensive fake picture in history and while you're doing it yeah you can funnel some money here and there but then once you do it you have to keep it going because people are like oh it's a great idea let's let's do stuff and then you know kennedy you know we're gonna go to the moon this decade and you do that the multiple shots around the moon and and they went what six times nobody punched through the van allen radiation belts was one of my scientific questions without any shielding no lead no gold well i, I can answer that if you want i mean oh that they went really really fast go ahead they are going they are going really really fast and for the van allen, van allen radiation belt to affect you physically you have to spend a significant amount of time in it but, which is and good were, and were, here's the problem yeah, though they, it, that that question it is a trap which is on my side which is uh, anyone that says well okay well you can get through it it's not that much of a threat if that's the case anyone listening all you have to do is go to nasa.gov and look up something called orion trial by fire in fact you just google it orion trial by fire it's a little video they made because they're talking about going to mars and they're saying oh yeah the first capsules that we send up there are going to be unmanned because we haven't figured out how to solve the van allen radiation problem yet and that, no, 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 no. It's that was not, at the end of 2014. It's, it's very clear. They won a local Emmy for this. It's a NASA video. You can go watch it. It's on YouTube right now. Oh, well, if it's on YouTube, I'll believe it. Okay, yeah, go to NASA.gov, <laughs> smart guy. Right, I, I want to pull that, that up. The photo of the Earth point the, that you made. Um, the, the, the blue marble shot was, yes, the only shot of the Earth taken in its entirety. Because all the other shots of the Earth taken from the earlier Apollo missions, the Earth was in shadow because of the position of the sun relative to the moon and the Earth. So they did take photos right from Apollo 8. And you see pictures of the whole Earth, but it is in shadow. Due to the orientation of the sun, the moon and the Earth, Apollo 17 was the only mission where they managed to get the earth in its entirety with the sun directly behind them that's why it's the only one and then nothing uh, for 43 uh, years no company no pri private public government nobody took a picture of the earth for 43 years lots lots of companies lots of companies there are photos online and one of the f arguments of the flat, flat earth society is why does that photo look completely different to that there's a japanese satellite that took one and the reason that nasa stitch together their composite photos is purely because of resolution because the photo that the japanese satellite took of the earth in its entirety the resolution was awful so that's why they are stitched together hmm. it's not a conspiracy that's that's the reason because uh, it I'm, looking at, I'm looking at nasa.gov and i'm looking at the i might be looking in the wrong place am i looking am i supposed to look in the journey to mars area no just that, just that place? just go into google and type in orion trial by fire the first one that'll come okay. up, the first one will come up should be from the NASA website. Okay. You'll see it. I mean, it's, it, the kid comes out, you know, and they're talking in great detail about the Orion project. And, and again, it won a local Emmy down there to where they were saying, we, you know, to go through this region of space, we're going to have to solve the, it's really clear about it, have to solve the radiation belt problem. 
and you know with all special effect things and making ominous music and making it sound like the van allen was this horrible horrible thing which supposedly it is or it isn't but that's my trap question which i'm trying to throw at an astronaut one of these days it's just like are they deadly yes or no you say no nasa says yes so and even van allen himself you know who worked for nasa go figure 1959 he said super deadly and and, and then a couple of years later when kennedy says we're going to the moon Everyone goes back to Van Allen and says, hey, how are you going to get through it? And he says, we're going to go really, really fast. The worst answer I've ever heard in my life. It's supposedly 60,000 miles thick. And yet you do round trips through these things, even if you're doing 17,000 miles an hour, 18,000 miles an hour. On the way out, that's one way. But on the way back, you have to slow down and hit the brakes to come in. And yet nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody had cancer. I think there's still six astronauts still alive. Even now, nobody got cancer. So no, not buying it. Right, I'll check. I'll check on that website. I'll have a look at it. But I think what they're worried about on a trip to Mars isn't the Van Allen radiation belt. It is the possibility of being hit by gamma rays as they travel through space. I mean, mm. you're completely unprotected, and gamma ray bursts are are deadly. You know, they, sure. they can like just vaporize you. Plus, I, I hear you. you've got the worry of space debris, uh, micrometeorites, a, a grain of sand traveling at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour, or just go straight through a ship. You know, so oh, they, which of, of, which reminds me, I am so glad you brought that up. Let's segue real quick to the International Space Station. One of, okay. one of my <laughs> favorites, <laughs> because that thing makes no sense at all uh, fr from a physics standpoint from a personnel standpoint from a health standpoint uh, l l l real quick if anyone wants to just have some fun with it without even going into the scientific look up something uh, uh on youtube called iss hairspray because i, I it made perfect sense for a production standpoint because women had long hair they don't anymore but they did for a number of years up until actually a couple of years had long hair it's like well you have a problem with that because if you are simulating a zero g environment you can't show any and the only way you can really do it without cgi is to use the the vomit comet you know the the zero g planes that they test with but those hit turbulence and you get these little bumps and so you would notice that with with people with long hair so instead of putting a cap on them or tying their hair back they permed their hair Oh, it stuck up like the Bride of Frankenstein. It never moved. You could bounce a quarter off of it. At, but that's for, for even. Let's let's put that aside for a second. How about something like <laughs> the the vacuum of space? I had a vacuum okay. ex. I had two vacuum <clears throat> experts come on my show, and he says the vacuum of space is so amazingly powerful that basically aluminum can with plastic would have just blown to pieces in two seconds the the vacuum would have ripped it to shreds he goes there's a reason why submarines are so big and heavy he goes they're made out of solid steel and even they you know even the military subs can only go down so far be before they hit crush depth anyone doubts this you can go up on youtube to type in the power of a vacuum well, it's because yeah it, it's because the the weight that people don't think about they think of water or something but the mass of the water above you is what causes it, pressure exactly he goes if it's if you mass. if you put a submarine in space it'd be fine because it's so structurally dense that there's no way i mean even the vacuum of space would have a tough time bursting that thing because but there isn't any steel up there it's all aluminum and plastic he goes and, and not only that the, the spacesuits in fact that's my new challenge to astronauts recently which is before it's like people say what will it take to convince you that the earth is a globe i go okay put a 4k camera on a rocket turn it on do not turn it off don't show me any edit cuts and let that suck don't drop it off of the second stage or the first stage let that thing keep going no my new test is way easier and that is give me an astronaut suit and put me in a vacuum chamber it'd be nice if i had another astronaut in there with me so i could see what happened to him <clears> at the same time the astronaut suit cannot work in a pure vacuum it, they would blow up like the michelin man it would become <clears> rigid you would have no flexibility your your elbows wouldn't move your <clears> knees <throat> wouldn't be able to move your fingers would be useless there's nothing you would be able to do there and and so it's like well no no we've seen astronauts train it's like you've seen them train in water and there's a really specific reason why they do that because it looks good on camera it looks good if you're going to train in water which train in water that's the opposite of what, what you want to do if you're training with a vacuum there's no resistance at all you're training in water you might as well be training in soup Ugh. there's no right. can, and, I, and, can, I, 
Can I respond? Yes. <laughs> what? Right. Can we stop you? <laughs> no, actually. Uh, the suits do blow up, okay? They have got many, many, many layers. They're very, very thick. To they, Obviously, they have to withstand the pressure that's inside. They have to withstand the cosmic radiation, etc. Um, they are very, very difficult to move in. If you see the shots of the, of the guys on the moon, you'll see them walking funny because they can't bend their knees. The cameras that they used had a massive shutter button on them because there's no way you'd be able to manipulate your finger to be able to press the shutter on a normal camera. So everything had to be adapted to the very, very limited movement that you've got in a spacesuit. And these guys that do the spacewalks, you know, and you're saying that it's a NASA thing. I mean, Russia was up there first. And, and I've seen footage from the cockpit of Yuri Gagarin showing, clearly showing the curvature of the Earth. Mm. You know, so, I mean, the, the, the experiments that they do and the spacewalks that they do are adapted for this limited movement in a spacesuit. And as far as, as, as nothing it should explode, you're, you've only, you're only putting it up to the pressure of one atmosphere which isn't a lot. You, you could have a couple of layers of tin foil. And, and that's what the, uh, the lunar module was only a couple of layers of tin foil, you know, is equal thickness. So it didn't need to be strong in the vacuum of space. Yeah, uh, not, a, not a chance. <laughs> Sorry, I've seen, I've seen too many test videos on vacuums down here. A vacuum would just, they would destroy no, you, everything. You, everything would be destroyed. No, 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 no. I know you've seen videos well, I, I've been researching this since I was a kid, so I know what I'm talking about as well. I'm not just coming up with stuff that I've made notes on. Yeah. All right, I, I have correlated this evidence, and I have watched numerous, numerous videos and blogs on the flat Earth, and there isn't one piece of information that you guys have come up with that have made me stop and think and thought, wow, there's something to this. It is all a complete misunderstanding of physics and mathematics. I, 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 then I have, I have to ask, do you, are you one of those people that, that is heavy math, background in physics, that sort of thing, or a background no, in fi physical not, science? Not at all. Not at all. I'm interested in astronomy. I have been since I was a kid. Uh, I've not got any particular outstanding qualifications from the school I went to, but I have got a basic understanding of physics and geometry, and that is all you need to blow the theory out the water. Because it's checkable. It is checkable physics, checkable experiments you can do. And they do not work on a flat Earth model. They just don't. And unfortunately, and I have spoken with some amateur astronomers, and I'm not trying to pick. Amateur astronomers are just one step down from uh, someone that's heavy into physical sciences because look you, you want to believe it you, you your conditioning is about as thorough as anyone i i've had in fact i had an amateur astronomer that told me it's like look i can see uh the moons of jupiter from from my telescope in my backyard i've, I've seen the rings of saturn and i go fine i go go to a planetarium with a pair of binoculars do the rings of saturn look real to you and you go yeah but you're inside a building i go yes i go but if you walk outside Who's to say you're just not in a much, much bigger building? You're relying on the faith of military. Don't, don't make a mistake. NASA is DOD the entire way, always have been. They're uniquely military, uh, built on the, the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. I mean, Werner von Braun, we, we got him from somewhere. So I, I, I understand that, you know, you love astronomy and you love the planets and everything, but the, the pictures you're being shown are from a, a group that is motivated to protect this thing. And it's not, it's not just the, the pictures we're shown, Mark. It is the model as a whole, the, the mathematics that so, it tells us. So you, be, the, you the, believe the, the Americans, is... you believe the Americans went to the moon wholeheartedly, 100%. They went so, to the moon. So, totally. And I'll tell you for why. Because... The Russians and the Americans, as I said to you, the Russians went up there first, so they must have been the first to propagate this myth of a globe we live on, okay? Mm -hmm. Right? The Russians and the Americans were in a space race. We had all around the world satellite dishes pointed at the moon as Neil Armstrong descended in the lunar module. Mm. And they even showed the hiccup as he changed the landing site because there was massive craters in the way so you see him come down you see him go back up and then come back down again 
Now, every satellite dish in the world was pointed towards the moon, ready to trip up the Americans, because this had already started, this conspiracy theory. So the Russians would have been the first to bang on about it. Ex no, it's all a conspiracy. Except, except the, the Russians world. have been our silent partners in crime since the beginning. They were there in Antarctica during the whole thing, along with six other countries. We needed their They've help. Been partners. They've not been partners. They were bombers. <laughs> not a chance. No, 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 no. Wait, did, didn't, you ever, didn't it ever bother you that the space race just stopped? Didn't that ever bother you? The Americans get there and then the Russians just quit? When's the last time you saw a sporting event where the first person crosses the finish line and the people behind go, eh, I'm done. They just walk off. The space race shouldn't have stopped there. We should have gotten there, and then the Russians get there. And it's like, we have four people on the moon, they have five. We have a small base, they have a bigger base. Then Time Magazine runs a thing that says, is the Cold War now on the moon? But it was the exact opposite. We got there, and then the Russians just quietly shut it all down, and they never, the ever... Russians, uh, the Russians had already beaten the Americans. They had the first satellite... They had the first animal. They had the yeah, first man. Yeah, sure. They had the first woman All fake. In space. All of it They've quick. Done it. All of it fake. Why did they quit? Why? Why did they quit? They no one. They no quit. one can ever it, answer it, that. It was all. It was all a propaganda stunt for, for the for the for the for the public. That's what it was. So the Americans had already got to the moon. So why would the Russians go to the moon? What would that achieve? Oh, what are you kidding? Is, why why no. would the cold Why would the Cold War even extend at all if they weren't going to go to the moon? The reason why it stopped. I'll tell you the reason why it stopped. Because cinematically, you can't have two production houses in two different com well, not even different countries. You can't even have them in two different cities without having continuity problems meaning if we build a set that looks like the moon and they build a set light that looks like the moon it better be absolutely identical oh meaning, really yep Even absolutely serious? absolutely serious 100 well, percent serious problem in that one is i think the problem with with that just just to chime in myself um would be i mean you could build you could build sets all over the country to to act like you were going to the moon if you if that's what would be there because the moon is a gig it, in in our theory the the moon is a gigantic place True. so you would never hit unless you landed on top of somebody you wouldn't have to worry about about building the moon in the exact same way because you could just say well we landed 500 miles away from it so yeah, it looked but, absolutely different but you have to you so, have to have the production the, the production techniques have to be identical meaning the the ash color has to be the same the lighting has to be the same the lack of stars i'm not even going to get into that has to be the same well, it, get into it get into it please well, you know, I got an answer for that as well. I no, I don't. I don't even want to talk about the stars. That's that's too easy. I, throw throw me the intersecting shadows. When the advertising company that shot this thing decided, oh, you know what, this isn't lit right. Let's bring in a second light source. And then their technical advisor didn't correct him and say, you know, you can only have one light source in the moon. And then you have intersecting shadows, which should not happen. Don't tell me it's time lapse or any of that crap. It's not time lapse. The intersecting shadows are because of the orientation of the objects the light is passing through. That's why you get an intersecting shadow. And it has been reproduced. It has whatever. been reproduced. Whatever. <laughs> never you were okay. never going to convince me. Okay, fine. Blast crater. How about blast crater? 10,000 pounds of thrust. Not a single ounce of dust anywhere. Everything was super shiny like it was just sat there. No blast crater from this thing. All right. Okay, I'll beg to differ on that one as well. The Lunar Reconnaissance Rover. As the uh, lunar module raised into the air, it took several photos of the moon's surface. And it's an old photo and it's grainy, but you can clearly see the tracks of the lunar rover. Uh, this is on a later mission. And you can see the footprints of the astronauts. You can also see the experiments of the left, which we bounce a laser off every so often. I'll go into that later. Um, when the lunar reconnaissance rover, uh, sorry, the Lu lunar reconnaissance surveyor orbited the moon, it took several shots and took shots of the landing site. Now these, if you orientate it to the right direction and resize it, it fits exactly, fits exactly. You can see the, the, crate, the blast crater. Um, it isn't a massive blast crater because it didn't need to be. The, 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 um, the gravitational pull of the moon is nothing like the Earth. Yeah, it's, a, it's only it's only one sixth. Yeah, I get that. By the way, that means that a 180 pound man would weigh 30 pounds, which means yep. his vertical jump would be a lot higher than what they were doing. 
a lot higher because these guys were athletic. It's not like they were just some schlubs from the street. They should have had feats of strength. My God, they should have been lifting those cars. By the way, why were the cars there? The, the vehicles didn't show any fun, descriptive things, how they put those together, even though supposedly they only went nine so, miles. So you're saying how much? 100, 100 and what pound man? 180 pound man, one sixth gravity, works out to be 30. Right, with, with, a, <clears throat> with a how many hundred pound spacesuit on? 100, and whatever. And what do you mean, 100 and something pound spacesuit? Come on. Do you know how much it weighs? It doesn't weigh a hundred and something weight. pounds. I can't imagine it being light, Mark. I can't imagine it being something you could just put over your shoulder and carry. Oh, by the way, you should also talk about the backpack that has enough compression to defeat a vacuum of space and uh, still enough power to heat and cool them and also run electronics for communications all in this backpack in the 60s. No. No. Yes. No! <laughs> Its technology yes. does not exist back then. Battery technology was piece of crap. And how are you beaming back images at all? How are you beaming, beaming back television images with almost no processing power back then? And we're talking, you know, frames per second. They're, they're supposedly shooting back. It does. The technology does not fit. Does not. I think, I think a lot of your problem, Mark, is you're misinformed. And you need to do a lot more research because this stuff, as I say, is completely checked. And you're holding on too tight to a globe which you love. No, I'm holding on tight to common sense mm. and checkable scientific okay. evidence. Well, I, so we're not talking about space anymore because space is kind of cracking me up. Oh, yeah, by the way, too. sorry, sorry, um, the, the Tesla. No, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question because I've, I've been doing my research on this stuff and the flat earth theorists that have the things that were under a dome and the things that we see um like with telescopes like i can pull a telescope out and i can it depends on how powerful my telescope is what i can see i can see um constellations i can see um planets i can see different things like that so it with the flat earth theory those things are all projections on the um Yes. On the basically, the ceiling of it. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, either built, well, it's, I doubt if it's front projection. It's probably uh, rear projection or built into the system itself. Yeah, it's just a high tech version of any planetarium that we've had for, well, what, since the 1970s? And don't, and don't forget, these are the same planetariums that if people say, oh, no, you couldn't do that. It's like the same planetariums you, on the weekends, they would turn off the stars and turn it into laser Led Zeppelin and laser Floyd and. You can do anything you want with a planetarium, especially, you know, with the technology that's more so, advanced than ours. So if I'm putting it on the on the the ceiling mm -hmm. and I see like basically a dot from from where I'm looking at, right. then when I pull up a um, when I pull up my telescope, right. that dot comes into focus and I can see things in there. So um, I guess my question is, are these. Because if I'm looking at the projection and the, it's a dot, the closer I get to a thing, it wouldn't come into to as sharp a focus. Because, I mean, we can see Mars. We can see dust storms. Like we would look at um, – what I think it's – is it Saturn has the, the uh, hurricane that's been going for a thousand years? No, or whatever, the big red dot. no it's Jupiter. The, um... Jupiter. Okay. So we can see movement on these things. So, it, you know – how can we focus in and see these things that are going on with a projection? Because if I look at a projection on my ceiling now, the closer I look at it, it if, if I can, I guess, perception, you know, how does that work or what is the explanation? For that? Because we're seeing different things. I guess it would be just how they put it on the Yeah, I mean, wall, what? I what what kind of TVs do we have now? 8K? I've, I've kind of lost track. I mean, imagine... Uh, it's 4K right Is now. it only 4K? The, um, yeah. Imagine okay. if you gave us another 50 years, what we we could come up with as far as display goes. I mean, the resolution, as far as I can tell, is just comes down to, you know, how, how small we can crank it down. But look at the jumps we've had there in just literally 20 years. We didn't even have HD 20 years ago, right? that's what we're talking about here uh an advanced system that is far far beyond us and i know for some people it's tough to imagine but it's like really take take a smartphone and go back in time 100 years see if you can try to even explain how that works to uh, the average person on the street other than say it's a phone 
you know, he tried to explain anything else on that thing. So that's what I got. So recently your group, I, I think we had talked earlier and you said it was somebody from that you knew or from your group or something like that, that recently tried to basically shoot himself up to the, to the top of the dome. <laughs> oh, mad, mad Mike. Yeah. 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 It didn't work out too good for him. He ended up crashing and shit like that. And, yep. and, but you know, one of the things you were talking about was the next thing he wants to do is go up to the height of where the guy jumped from the Red Bull thing. F- Felix Baumgartner. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, f- so go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, the, the guy we're talking about is mad Mike. You can look him up. And his first launch was really just to wear, uh, raise awareness for the whole Flat Earth thing. To, to be honest, he's he's late to the Flat Earth game, and, and he was looking for funding, and we helped fund his rocket, which was fine. I, it turns out it was the best money I think we'd spent in a long time because it, you know the media just jumped all over the place. But he was only going to go up a couple thousand feet, and which, was, again, was, was going to do nothing. You know, a couple thousand feet is like there's mountains like next to him that were higher than that. Uh, but what he's planning on doing the next time, and it's really interesting because the Felix Baumgartner Red Bull jump, which if you look at the pictures, it, you know, obvious using a fisheye slash peephole lens because the, the curvature of the earth at 120,000 feet or 130, wherever Felix was, was so severe, uh, the earth would have been only the size of, I don't know, Arizona, if that, but what Mad Mike's trying to do is, and again, I don't. I advise this to anyone who might be listening. Uh, he wants to take a, a balloon, you know, attach that same rocket or a version of it to a balloon, go up to 120,000 feet and either just take pictures or launch it from there. I, I think it's extremely ill-advised because we're talking about massive temperature swings up there. There's an oxygen factor to consider. You know, is he going to even take up? I, his survival rate launching down the ground, I think that was actually pretty good. Uh, doing his experiment, which he's talking about, which we have, our community really has no, we, you know, I've, I've already volunteered. Well, I didn't volunteer to be the backup pilot on his next jump. I volunteered for the one in the desert. But the, I don't think... I don't think he's going to be doing that one anytime soon. <laughs> I really don't. I would hope not. So in your research or in the research of this, um, it, I could be wrong here. The theory is that the dome is about 100 miles high and about 100 miles thick. So if you go high, you freeze to death. If you go low, you burn to death. Because of the stuff. Oh, for the uh, so, the, the magma stuff. I, it's probably it's probably yeah. higher than 100 miles. Although I don't I don't know. I remember commercial airlines cap out at 10 miles. Spy planes supposedly at 20. Uh, so, but I'm sorry. Your question was what uh, about the about the thought of it's if you, the dome is built to a um, this enclosure, whatever you call it, is yeah. built to if you go one way you'll freeze. If you go the other way you'll bake. Right. So it keeps us within this keeps us within the you could say the comfort zone. Yeah, there's um yeah. The the natural rein, re, uh, negative reinforcements that were built into this place were ingenious. I mean, very very clever. Uh yeah, like you said, you go up high enough, you're going to run out of oxygen, you know, even if you could find a, a way. And if you go out, if you try to dig deep enough, again, I'm going to point to mainstream science here. They tell us what all the bands are of the core of the earth going all the way down to 4,000 miles to the center, and yet the deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles. Uh, the Russians tried for decades, and so did the Germans, and their drill bits just kept melting. And then the uh, when you go out to the outer edge, which I always thought was great, was the when you try to go out to Antarctica, or try to you know go as far south as you can, uh, the, the water keeps getting colder and colder until you get icebergs, and then finally you run into the mm-hmm. uh, Antarctic ice. But, of course, the, the, the one more subtle thing is the 3% salt solution added to the oceans, which reduced exploration by, I don't know, 90-something percent because you couldn't drink what you were sailing on. That, that to me, was brilliant. That slowed everything way down. The ocean is the desert. Mm, it is. Now, with, with that thought in mind, and I just thought, you know, the, um, the warmest place, on earth is the is the equator because that's where we are closest to the sun sure. so if you is where all the tropics are and all that stuff so if you would if you would go around the equator yeah 
if you could possibly navigate the equator around the Earth yeah. and do that with, a, let's say, an airplane. Yeah. With being the hottest place on Earth, you could never run into ice. But with your model, you will run into ice either going east or west. You'll you'll run into it either way. Yeah, if you, you will hit this wall. Yeah, if you can bypass the compass, if you can bypass magnetic north. Again, remember, we're talking about redundancy systems here. It's all meant to keep us from figuring out where we are. Eventually, yeah, if you could bypass the compass, if you could bypass the GPS, if you could just fly in one direction, eventually you are going to run into the, well, the beginning of the edge. It's going to get colder, and eventually you're going to run into the coastline of Antarctica, no matter which way you go. So, okay. So here's... One of the things that you had had in one of your videos was a story about um, a race of people that discovered that hey, this is the, we're in this enclosure, and they built this this um, thing to meet the creator. Right, right. The the biblical story that I didn't use any chapter or verse. I thought I'd leave it up to basically it was Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel story. Right? Yep, yep. Tower of Babel story. Yeah. And they reached up and they met, met the, now I thought when you were talking about that, when you were talking about the, the, the math and the science stuff, I thought you were talking about Atlantis. No. Not, I thought Tower of Babel and Atlantis kind of mixed together. Oh, that's that's so, in, that's interesting because you're right. Yeah, I did use some high tech in there. So good and Yeah, because you know, that's why I thought it was Atlantis. Yeah. So so you're talking Tower of Babel. Now you were talking the the base of this was hundred miles, hundreds of miles wide, and sure. went up. The whole thing went up. So when they wiped out, you know, Tower of Babel, we were still around. So they they basically reset the entire world, but we're still here. Why uh, yeah. wouldn't they reset it with another species versus humans well, again? That's just it. I mean, and I don't want to get into too much biblical stuff. Uh, but as far as older civilizations go, I and I've, I've said this on many a thing. I do not think we are the first people to rent this apartment by any stretch. You know, we, we have history gaps and we all know this. I mean, there's all sorts of fun things out there that we have no idea. Uh, you know, uh, the sunken cities off of India, the sunken cities off of Japan, uh, you know, are the Bosnian py pyramids real? The Bimini Road, is there Atlantis? Was there Mu? Who really built the pyramids? I don't think it was the Egyptians. I was out there. I don't think they have anything to do with it. Uh, so I, you know, because I don't think it's a one-off, meaning, you know, civilizations come and go, they, they, they last a certain amount of time, and then you do some terraforming, you know, try to, try to mix things up a bit, maybe make some alterations, uh, change, change up continents, change up oceans, whatever you have to do, and then, you know, let another civilization take over at that point. It, it seems to, you know, why not? I mean, it seems like we've kind of come to the end of our run anyway. We, we've had 5,000 years, and we we seem to have peaked out in terms of what we've been able to do and uh, i think that i think just now the, that trump's president you guys want to take it down right no no yeah. no i know i don't i don't, don't, I don't for every no no no, no, no. i i don't vote i don't vote but it is a little odd that we america would 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 elect a reality television star as president but but that has nothing really to do with it it is it is more um uh novelty Meaning, I think we've, you, you know the term, jump the shark. I think we, we've jumped the shark more or less as a civilization in that we've done just about as much as we can do here. And I think even the revealing of this, the reason why it's caught on so much in the last three years, and, and we're, be, we're allowed to do this. You know, we're, we're actually being helped by Google and YouTube and, and social media and, and all these other avenues. Uh, I think it's part of the process to where eventually we're going to figure out what this place is. Nobody, nobody gets to, to, to use this thing forever. Uh, it's kind of like... Um, you can you can move stuff around and hide things for a while, but you can't hide it. You can't hide it completely. Uh, kind of like when when the governments figured it out in the nineteen nineteen well, round up, see nineteen sixty. You know, it's like okay, because think think about this. Let's say the people did find out. You know, we're we're talking about the potential of chaos that that's no one ever seen before. You know, academic, economic, spiritual. Uh, it's a short meeting for those guys to say, look, let's just keep keep this thing under wraps for as long as we can. And that turns out to be about 60 years. And then I think they've, they've got a backup plan in place. I mean, we're not these brilliant people that are thinking we're smarter than scientists. A lot of us are just connecting the dots. But I think those breadcrumbs have been left for us. Uh, and Why? 
Uh, if they want to keep it under wraps, why are they leaving breadcrumbs? I have a question from the chat room, r real quick. There's oh, sure. a lot of questions Which, in here. Max, I, I can imagine a specific one. Yeah. Um, he said, um, if the Earth was flat, yeah, uh, would we not be waving the atmospheric pressure, and would that not cause constant earthquakes on Earth? And could be, could we not see such movement in the distant mountain ranges? We what was that first word wave, waving the atmosphere? Yeah, I think he's written it wrong. Waving. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure what he means by we, that. So. Yeah, he said wave, be waving in the atmosphere. Uh, would I don't know what he. Oh, although I, I've got to mention, okay. I've got to mention, if, if he's going to bring up the atmosphere thing, let me throw out a quick thing because it just reminded me. And that is a lot of people will say, because it's a common question, and it might show up in the chat room. It's like, okay, why can't you see Japan from San Francisco? You know, why can you not okay. see forever? And it's like, okay, the, the average person keeps forgetting that what you're breathing is is not nothing. It's something. You know, you're breathing one part oxygen and, and four parts nitrogen, you know, excluding some trace gases and crap like that. And it's kind of like a soup. It's really like a, like a thin version of water. And that will show distortion over a period of time. And I know some people don't like me to say it, but it's like, look, if you pulled out the atmosphere, and I know you can't do it, but if you could pull it out, I think you could see very, very, very far. And, uh, you know, given weather conditions and, well, actually the weather would be gone if there'd be no atmosphere. So, yeah, you could see much, much further. So. It's strange that I can see these um, painted on or projected pinpoints of light that are on the dome, how many hundred miles up, but I can't see a great distance with a telescope over the horizon. So it kind of, hmm. Hmm. you see what I mean? Uh, I do. Why, I do. Why, why doesn't it work from that height? Why are the stars perfectly perfect pinpoints of light well they're, they're, they're not so well one i'd probably claim like mandelbrot resolution meaning you know it's it's good enough to where it it's going to the resolution is almost perfectly balanced up at that height but as far as the distortion from the atmosphere don't know other than it gets thinner as you're looking farther up as opposed to looking across a body of water to where it's a consistent distortion that just gets more compound and gets thicker and thicker and thicker, which is what we've seen. I mean, long distance, you can look up long distance photography world records, and I think the longest ones are 300 kilometers, give or take. And most of those are taken from peak to peak where the atmosphere is much, much thinner and there's a lot less distortion. Peak to peak, there's, there's, the, uh, there's the, the crux of it, peak to peak because you are elevated oh sure so you can you can see that far at ground level you can't see oh that far. yeah you still can but if the world but the world records <laughs> the world's records you can at those peak to peak it's not necessarily peak to peak is the deal it is that you're looking through much much thinner atmosphere but at ground level you still should not be able to see what you see tell me how a boat goes over the horizon miles and miles away 20 30 miles whatever it is and i've talked to everyone you can think of civilian military professional photographers and then it's gone right you, with your eyes it's like it's gone it's gone over the horizon and then you could pull it back into frame hd technology has changed the game now we you can see pull it back into frame that's the thing you yes you can pull, pull it back into frame do you have any videos that are out no. there of people pulling everything back into frame not just boats lighthouses buildings it. The only way you can pull it back into frame is by elevating yourself. No, 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 no. These people are sitting on the beach. They're probably five feet off the ground, if that. Well, the only way that would work is if it has gone out of frame due to heat haze. <laughs> I'm talking about a clear day when you can see, and I've seen it and Scott has seen it. I was in the tall ships race, which I don't know if you've heard of. Right? I was in the tall ships race, and yeah. these are all massive square rigger ships. Yeah. And I have seen them disappear over the horizon, so like as clear as day for a pair of binoculars, only see the very top of the mast. Clear as day, not hazy at all. And it was as if it was dropping. And I've got a Na I've got an I've got a Navy missile instructor. I can trump that. A Navy missile instructor that at night, using infrared at forty miles, can see a boat. And he goes, infrared does not lie. He goes, mirages do not give off infrared signatures. So, who are you going to believe? That, what is he, the, he at said, what point, uh, well, I guess my question is, when you're, you're talking point to point, like like uh, communications, when you're talking point to point with radio waves, basically a sight line 
kind of communication. Now, at what point from one point to another, mathematically, would you, 40 miles isn't that much, especially on a flat plane like the ocean. You're not seeing the, what is well, the, but it. Well, but it is. At what point That's... Do, you see, do you see the curvature of the Earth? Uh, how far would two distances have to be? I'll look that up, I guess. Um, if if uh, I can break down the, the math for you. Anyone who's out there listening, eight inches, the, the curvature, mainstream, this is not our formula. This is mainstream. Eight inches per mile per mile. Otherwise, eight inches per mile squared. So, and it, and it gets really, it, 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 it has to get more and more pronounced because eventually it's going to go vertical if it's, if it's a ball. So, again, three miles, it, three miles isn't that much, right? Three miles is three times three, which is nine, times eight inches, which is 72, about six feet. But if you go out at like 50 miles, that's 50 times 50 times eight, which is over 1,600 feet. And that's a lot. That's a lot. There are no boats that are 1,600 feet tall or even 800 feet tall. They're very, very low. And we can see that the Chicago skyline is the famous one. And fine, if you guys want to say that the Chicago skyline is legit, that's fine. I've watched the time-lapse video from the beach. And unless you can tell me that a mirage maintains its, its integrity through, I don't know, 12 hours of different light and weather, a rainstorm moved in, nothing changed, and then it went to darkness and you could see the city lights and everything was fine. Was there a little bit of atmospheric lensing at the end? Sure. Why not? But it was 12 hours. I would be surprised if you didn't see it. Sorry. Where are we going? From Where from distance? What distance, Mark? Uh, 50 miles. 50 Just type miles. 50 miles. Type in over Lake Michigan. Type in uh, flatter Chicago skyline. You'll see a bunch of different right. versions. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to check the mathematics on that. And on how tall a building we, has to be to be seen over 50 miles on a curved earth. We, there's but stuff. There, there is a, there is an, there's another experiment that, that has been done several times. Mm -hmm. And um, it is just firing a laser across the water and measuring it at a point. So they know the fixed point of when the laser was fired. Yeah. And they know the fixed point. It's a high powered laser. Yeah. And they know the fixed point of where the laser reached the target yeah. so many miles away. Right. And there was a significant drop in ground level as the atmosphere curved away from the laser. So how, how does that so work? So are you so saying... On a flat earth model, a flat earth model I, it should be we, a constant height, shouldn't it? We've done, we've done the same sort of test. We just did some over in Hungary with a group called FE Core, which stands for Field Engineer Core. Uh, another group down in Brazil did it. We've been doing laser tests all over the place. We do not find those results. We all, it's, I mean, if you can get past the beam dispersal, the problem is if you take just a garden variety laser, which is why we used military lasers over in Hungary. Yeah, this is a high power. Yeah, high powered laser. Yeah, if you can use a high powered laser, that's fine. If you if anyone's trying to do it with a normal laser, of course you get beam dispersal, which I think is mm -hmm. a foot per mile or something like that, which makes the beam just ridiculously huge and, and it's difficult to figure out what's going on there. Uh, but the stuff we've done it says the opposite. We, in fact, we I think if I'm not mistaken, I'm still waiting for the video on it. Is uh, uh, they set some world record? They called Guinness World Record to this lake out in Hungary, and they shot it. I can't remember what it was in kilometers. I'd have to look it up. But uh, it turned out perfectly fine, which was why I was expect. I was never worried about this particular experiment, long because it goes along with the long distance photography. And the, uh, let me, I'll throw out the the Navy guy. I had one of my very first guests, Navy Missile Sparrow Instructor, who said that, look, we're using two, and we're talking mili heavy military tech, we're using two degree beam radar, we're going ship to ship, point to point, and he goes at, at, he goes at 50 nautical miles easily, which is 60 ground miles, because nautical is a little longer. And he goes, he goes, we're not bouncing off anything. We're not putting it up in the air and bouncing off some sort of atmospheric layer. He goes, we, we have to paint the target for the missile system. He goes, you can't paint a mirage. It cannot happen. He goes, we never miss. So that's the thing. That's the thing. It does bounce off the atmosphere. He, he, so what, he's lying? He, he's just making it up? He's just saying no. He, he says we're pointing straight at. You're saying he's pointing straight up. It's not, it's not pointing. It's radiating out, isn't it? It's it's it, it's, it's, it's a, a it's a two degree point to point beam radar. It's it's a straight shot. Point to point to point. Okay, right, and um, and that's over fifty miles. Yes. And how Look, I, I would I would have quit Earth? this years ago if anyone would have come towards me. Any of these guys 
that called me up. And I didn't even have to. I didn't know any of these guys were. Call me up. They're all saying the same thing. All the pilots are saying the same thing. It's like, look, we see it's flat. Look, it, it, everything that we do, the, the surveyors, it, all our projects, the surveyors were fantastic. <laughs> the surveyors saying, look, we're doing 10 mile and 20 mile square plots of land and all the other projects that back up against <laughs> us, north, south, east, west, south, east, northwest. He goes, like you're stacking crackers next to each other. Nothing is out of sync. Everything lines up perfectly. They snap together like Legos. And he goes, he goes, the curvature of the earth is not taken into account, he goes, which is interesting goes because 95% of the world's surveyors are planar surveyors, P-L-A-N-A-R, which means the projects, you treat them like the world is absolutely flat. But of course, it can't be absolutely flat because we're told when we're six years old that it's a globe. It's got to be crazy. It's got to be insane. I know. I chewed on this thing for nine months trying to understand why why you subscribe to this with the overwhelming weight of evidence against it. Really <laughs> if, it if it was overwhelming then I, my numbers should not be growing and everybody else in the community shouldn't be growing and heck i had that the i had the biggest youtube an indictment of the education system on this planet at the moment so everybody's an idiot everybody's an idiot well, and I'm nobody not, should be I'm believing not, this i'm not going to call you names mark i'm not going to descend to that so oh you want to go I ahead take a names. shot no, 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 no. No one's taking it. No one's taking a shot at anybody as far as like calling anybody idiots or anything like that. That is no, not no, really I, the intent. I don't need to. My argument. You, you so, said so, I'm saying that just, science is not infallible. That is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that they don't make great things. Hey, light bulbs, air conditionings, microwave oven, great, wonderful. I use all of them. Most people don't even know how microwave ovens work, and we've had them for 40 years. But you can't make, if you're science, you've, science has turned into a pseudo-religion which makes claims about things that they cannot even remotely back up, like the core of the earth. You drill down eight miles, you stop, and you say, oh yeah, by the way, we know exactly what it looks like all the way 4,000 miles down. And not only that, we know what the core of Venus looks like, and the core of Mars, and the core of Jupiter. Back in the day, they used to put little things at the bottom of them and say, well, this is only speculation, blah, blah, blah. But now, they took that small print out, and now it's gospel. That gospel. Those it's little theory. things... It's a, check it's a checkable theory based upon the evidence that we have. By the evidence that we have, we see that magma fires out of volcanoes. Therefore, there must be a layer of magma underneath the crust. We have a magnetic field that surrounds the Earth and protects us from the sun's violent rays. Okay? So where does that come from? You the don't know. Is you a don't... massive ball of iron <laughs> that is being spun round by the Coriolis effect. Uh, unless, it's, unless, it's unless it's not. Unless it's not. Unless it's something much more simple. You, the, the, Carl Sagan had a. I, I was going to ask you about that. I, I had read in, in one of your videos. <clears throat> we were talking about it was talking about the magma, and the um, the theory is that the magma is produced by machines that sure. create a I, I should call it a layer of magma, basically to keep us from going down there to see. If, if, if this place, there. yeah, you're absolutely right. If this place is art, an artificial system, an enclosed world, a big building, okay. a big Hollywood backlot, then nothing is organic. And yes, the, I, I did catch some hell about this in the, in the beginning because people said, well, you can't, you can't mean that the magma is organic too, or, or, or manufactured too. And I'm going, why not? I go, if you have your favorite lizard in a terrarium you know the light bulbs there you got your you know, sand on the ground and a little water thing why would anything why would you leave anything to chance when it comes to anything that could be destructive you remember the magma system if super volcano were to appear our civilization would be decimated instantly so everything well, we have one what? yellowstone <laughs> well yes we they do and, and have had them in the past sure yeah. sure 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 but i'm saying that anything that happens along those lines happens between civilizations so unless it wipes out the civilization entirely so but everything is artificial the the jet stream up above the underwater conveyor system in the ocean the magma system plate tectonics everything everything is artificial just for us and it is a simple simple system that works very very efficiently space why? is why why do it what <laughs> well okay okay no 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 i about i'll bounce that question back at you carl sagan says there seems to be so much emptiness so much wasted space i'm not saying that god is lazy I'm saying that God is very, very efficient. If the entire population, with the exception of a few government people that find out about it, the entire population believes the illusion of space, 
that's what you go with. It's easy to do, especially if they're born into it, which is why I made some of the, the movie references. The line from The Truman Show, people believe the world that is presented to them. Plain and simple. Uh, the, the, line, the, the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village. You, you can take a bunch of kids. You can do this right <clears> now. <throat> take them out into a wildlife preserve. Tell them it's the 1800s. Take them, if you start when they're real young, they are never going to question you as long as you seal it off and, and make sure the details are nailed down. With something like this, it's easy to do. Why, why fake the, why, why create, and you're saying, well, God is all powerful. You don't have to create these vast, vast, vast chunks of emptiness of space. Not if people already believe their space. If you believe the illusion, that's your, that's your game plan. Why not? It's easy. It's efficient. It's small, compact. So uh, my question is um, two, two things. Mm -hmm. Number one is who is the cre who, who <laughs> really you want me to name this? god <laughs> and it, well i i don't know i mean yeah. what is your what is the theory about that and number two is it seems like in the past when people have have found out who the creator was or went knocked on the door and said hey we know you're there yeah. if the world became aware would that mean the extinction of the world uh, extinction, again, depends if you're looking uh, half full or half empty, meaning... I mean, it, because it be? basically the one it, the with the Tower of Babel reference, yeah. uh, when they found out, when they basically built the tower, did they go up and knock on a dome and say, dude, we know you're here, Yeah. and he wiped them out for, for that knowledge, it, so it, it, and then changed everything, so ignorance would be bliss. Yeah, scattered so them, yeah. If, it, so I guess my question is, by doing this, if if this turned out to be real and you went knocked on the dome one day, right. does that mean you would wipe out all of civilization? Uh, okay. I, I you know I do try to look half full when I look at some of this stuff because I don't. Okay. I, I'm not one of those doom and gloom conspiracy people. It's like run for your lives. No, I'm not going to do that. Well, I mean, in uh, but, that one reference, that's why I asked uh, because it, sometimes, it, like my theory with with uh, UFOs, like I. So I've been doing a show. I've talked to UFOs, and and people are like the government's hiding it from us. And I said, well, what if the government came to you and said, UFOs are real, aliens are real, we can never stop them, and they can do anything they want to anybody. Right. We would have mass chaos on the planet because people would be like, oh my god, and but, but, you know, then yeah, potentially, potentially, so, you're you're, abs you're absolutely right. Um, let me answer the first question, which is. Uh, are we talking about extinction? Extinction? I don't potentially see it as extinction. I see it as graduation, meaning every civilization has their time, their day in the sun, as it were, and then afterwards they have to move on. I mean, it's no, it's not. I, th I don't consider it sinister. So it's kind of like, kind of like school, where it's like, well, you know, you, you made your seniors now, and. Well, you, you don't have to, you don't have to, go, what's the line from the club? You don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here because we got another freshman class coming in. We, you know, we got we to gotta work on this thing again. And, and I still think you, you say aliens. I do believe in, in things that are flying up there. I've used night vision binoculars for years before I was into flat earth. Saw stuff flying all over the place. It was amazing. But I, now I don't consider them from other planets like Venus or Mars or something interdimensional like the last Indiana Jones movie or something like that. I see them as old versions of us. Just the, you know, the, the ones that used to be here who can fly around, who, you know, obviously have the unified field engines figured out that we're not going to ever get. And they're, if they fly around, do whatever, you know, are they, again, are they the janitors? Are they superintendents? Are they part of this place? Whatever. One thing is very obvious, though, is that they are, from protocol standpoint, they are not allowed to just land anywhere, anywhere Main Street and come out, take pictures and smile for the camera, sign a few autographs and go home because of what happens out there, like the uh, the, the cargo cult. You know, you, you do that and, and people will freak out and it'll change a, a lot of things. But I do think they're up there, sure. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we will graduate to that level. I don't know. It sounds a little weird when I say that, but then again, I open with Flat Earth, so how much more weird could it be? <laughs> I, I believe in ghosts so there you go i mean i well you know what it, the flat earth has changed my perspective to where i can't condemn any any fringe thing now to where it, there you go. people used to come at me and say oh you know i 
pretty sure that Elvis had Bigfoot's baby. And I'd be like, and normally I'd be like, get the hell out of here and, you know, change your meds. But now I'd be like, you know what? I'll give you a couple minutes. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> because I, you know, everybody in the flatter, I mean, I've done so many different conspiracy podcasts and stuff. And people, you know, I said that in my clues. I go, there's people that absolutely believe the royals are made of lizard people. And I will say, well, I got something for you. I got flat earth. And they'll just get the hell out of here. <laughs> they'll, they'll laugh me yeah, out we'll of the room. some things and won't take other things. Yeah. So I think what would be a good idea would be for, for, you know, Gary and I to do more of our kind of re more research mm -hmm. on this subject. Would you agree, Gary? Oh yeah, I've, I've been. I've just. And, uh, and I'd like to. I, I, I'd like I, I, to definitely the reason, visit this uh, subject again with you, Mark, and sure. to do just you know, do some more research and and to to look at this because you brought some good things about you know the laser and stuff like that. Um, and I like to to research a few things myself and and you know come back sometime and and talk to you again about it. Sure. Um, with, if, and. If, um, if you if you get a chance, there's there's stuff. And again, if you saw the clues, great, fantastic. Flat Earth clues, great I read, place. I, I got all twelve of them. I read. Yeah, I I, I did. You know, yeah. I I can't. You know, there's some things that I look at that and I'm like, okay, you guys are really grasping the straws yeah. because because you know talking about the magma machines and talking about you know this and that and sure. running the ice wall and especially in today's society, if something like that was out there. People would be reporting it like crazy, especially this, I mean, with all the cameras everywhere, with all the other things everywhere, and with all the explorers everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised somebody hasn't went to Antarctica and said, you know, okay, I've been there, I've seen this. Oh yeah, you can it. you can go there. I, I, again, I, I've said in the clue is it's like, look, it's not that you can't go to Antarctica. If you want to spend whatever, I think it's ten thousand American, you can get you can go down there, have your picture taken with penguins, and and have a great old time. Well, the thing but, is. It, the, the visiting Antarctica is like visiting another planet because it is not it's not conducive to human life at all. There's no plant, there's no animals, there's no nothing stuff right. you know stuff by the coast. Right. Once you move in from the coast, it is barren. And um, I mean, we I I uh, when I was in the military, one of the options they give you is to go to Operation Deep Freeze, which is in Antarctica for spent a year in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you gotta be out of your friggin' mind. I ain't down there for a year. Mm -hmm. But um <clears throat> but, you know, for someone you know, and I was I was thinking about Admiral Byrd. Now isn't Admiral Byrd the guy that said that he was at the North Pole and flew into a hollow earth? That's one of again, that was one of the weird things when I first got into this that really, really struck me because Admiral, most people, if you're into conspiracies at all, like what you just said, everyone remembers that. It's like, wait, wasn't he the guy that, that everyone knows that Admiral Byrd's tied to the hollow earth theory, which supposedly he did in 1926. <clears throat> he flew a rickety plane. I guess it wasn't too bad in 1926, the planes. They were getting better really, really quick. But he supposedly discovered, you know, a lot of weird stuff up in the North Pole. And you would have thought if that was true and that diary entry was true, if it was, that he would have stayed up there. But... The government had other plans, and they immediately and I and I, for me there was little doubt. It's like okay, if the if the North Pole, if there was something weird at the North Pole, then you had to go. You have to go check out the South Pole. Meaning, it's like okay, what is this place? You know, maybe there was something at the North Pole that was really really strange, which kind of hinted at, at an enclosed world. So they sent him literally down in 1928, turned him right back around, and he did mission. He literally spent the rest of his life flying. Uh, in Antarctica, flying, looking, looking, looking. And again, that wonderful clip from that CBS affiliate on the Long Jeans Chronoscope, where he comes on in 1954 and basically had given up and said, yep, yeah, well, the whole place is made out of money. Let's carve it up. There's there's coal, there's uranium, there's oil, there's minerals, there's everything you could ever See, want. I think he was just, I think he was just, shooting, to be honest with you, I think he was just shooting for extra money for expeditions to go there by telling you. I mean, he'd tell you no, to save diamonds. No, no, I, I, I would have thought the same thing, except that he was, he mentioned during the long version, I, I kind of edited a little bit in that <clears> thing <throat> to, for, to shorten the video length which was he was already scheduled he in fact he said during his video it's like oh yeah we're already we're already slated to go the the advanced team is already setting up base camp for uh, our mission in 19 for 1955 1956 and he was just kind of doing his press tour because he was the greatest living explorer at the time and 
then everything changed. He goes down to that mission and then he died one uh, one year later, apparently from a heart attack. I, you know, I don't want to necessarily think that's a complete conspiracy, but it wouldn't surprise me. He was always, in my opinion, way too candid when it came to his interviews. I mean, like, like during that thing, the, the little clip you saw in the clues where he said, he goes, yeah, and there's uranium down there. And he stops. He goes, yeah, I probably shouldn't, shouldn't have said uranium. I don't want to get myself into trouble because he knew like the, the whole Soviet thing. I was like, oh boy. So anyway. I've got, a, I've got a couple of quick five questions for you, Mark, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. I could talk to you a lot about this for hours. I know. <laughs> uh, Max, Max has said, um, I mean, in, in the globe model, the seasons are caused, the Earth is, is tilted on its axis, travels right. around the sun. Right. In summer, where we are, it's pointed closer towards the sun. We get more daylight, more heat. In right. winter, it points away. We get less daylight, less heat. So how does that work in the uh, flat Earth model? What causes the seasons? The sun and, and the moon, but mostly the sun, because we're talking about the, the primary heat source anyway, is the, is the sun travels around. It doesn't travel around the same path. So uh, depending on how old he is, if you remember the old record players, I can't believe I'm actually saying that. The, uh, the record players, the needle, as the song, the album progresses, the needle moves in. And if you reverse it, the, the needle moves out. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. The the sun takes a slightly different track every time around. There's some there's some decent computer models on it. You can look it up online. But that's what causes the, that. Do, do they know what causes that? That that. Oh, you I mean, mean on the on the can do it on the flat model? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean what what causes, what causes sun the sun to go in different paths? Oh, you mean or like if you're gonna go into that, why? Well. Well, no. What I'm, what he, you're asking the the detail, like what, like what the electromagnetic force that's holding the sun in the air, that sort of th sort of thing. No, you know, you're saying that the seasons are caused by the sun on on a narrowing orbit. Yeah, yeah, narrowing orbit, orbit and then expanding so orbit. So what's causing what's causing it to go in and out? What uh, physical force is causing that to happen? I, whoever built the place just decided it was going to be that way. I don't I don't know other than that. There's lots of little things that I would say. It's just builders, like dealer's choice, builder's choice. Okay. So. Um, and another question. Um, I've, got, I've got a listener in the chat room who uh, happens to be my aunt, and she lives in New Zealand. Um, and she can see a completely different set of stars than we can in the Northern Hemisphere. Right. Um, the, the Southern Cross being one, which is actually on the New Zealand flag. Yep. Why, why is that? Multiple projection systems, meaning if the planetarium, most of your planetariums have one you know, from a central point because it's cheap and you can just beam it, whatever. But if the planetarium was big enough, even, I don't know, 100 miles, let's say you were on one side of it and your friend was on the other side of it. You, your friend, and you, you look both up at the sky. You say, "Hey, look at the, I'm seeing the belt of Orion," and your friend says, "Hey, I'm looking to see the belt of Orion too." And you say, "Well, yeah, but my center star is red," and you go, "No, no, no, it's blue." Who's right? Actually, you're both right. Um, it's something we've been doing in software for oh boy, uh, fifteen going on twenty years, where it, it's instancing, uh, where you have multiple projection systems that can tailor itself to a geographic position. And, and I don't, there's some flat earthers that argue like, like, for example, I've seen this, the, the easier thing that you, the question you could ask is if you're at the exact point of the equator, you do a time lapse, cause you can see the photographs and the, and the, the videos on this, you know, the, the stars will literally split in half. One will go clockwise, one will go counterclockwise. And they'll say, how's that possible on a flat earth? I'm going, well, you just have one projection system over here and one over here. And that's how you do it. It's not, not, not too hard, but yeah, it's a good question. I, I get it. I don't know, probably every month. Yeah. All right, Scott. <laughs> he's, and I know for an astronomer, you're never. You're just going to shake your head and go, "He's absolutely out of his mind." But like, look. No, hey. he's, I, t I tell you what it is, right? And I mean this with the greatest respect for it with you, because yeah. you're entitled to believe what you want, Mark. But yeah. no matter what I say, what evidence I come up with, there is something you can say that would say that it's a lot of rubbish. It's all fake. It's like a self. A self-fulfilling, not a self, a self-something delusion, self-something delusion, you know what I mean? Self-fulfilling delusion, it's, 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 something like that? Yeah, some, I, something. Not, no, I, I, you know what I, mean? I understand, but at the same time, you got to remember, I've been answering questions on this for, well, let's say two and a half years. And okay. I've, but before I even started answering those questions, I stared at this thing and I basically said, okay, if I had to fake the world, 
If I had to hide it, if I had to hide the true shape of the world, what would I do? How would I build this place out? And I, I come from a, a from a tech background where you know world building is just one of the things we're into, especially in the entertainment That's industry. What I can't understand. I can't understand someone as educated and intelligent as you is is subscribing to this drivel. Why? I, I can't understand what? that, Mark. If, if oh, no, 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 it's all right. It, what? Th I'll, I'll throw it back at you and say, look, you believe it. You're a big science fan. You love math. You love science. You love astronomy. You probably like Star Trek and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> well, well, no, no, but I mean, you, I'm you have, you have story. your favorites. My, my, and there's been so many science fiction stories that have been written over, oh boy, 60, 70 years now, ever since we, we came up with the, the idea. And that is, what, didn't it even occur to you once that maybe one of them struck home? Maybe one of them was, was right. I mean, a, a Twilight Zone episode, an Outer Limits episode. We, we've written about this, mm. this concept for a long time. We've just never, it's always been in the frame. It's like, well, it's science fiction. It's not real. It's like, well, why, why couldn't it be real? And then eventually it's like, well, because NASA and all the other space agencies has said it's not. They've defined the world. Which I come back and I say, yeah, yeah. The, it, well, let's compare it just real quick. Uh, if God created the sun and the moon, sure, everyone knows that, right? If you, if you believe in the Bible. But it was science that said how big they were and how far they were away. They were ones that defined the shape of the universe. So... By mathematical calculations. Eh, and again, I, I'll, I'll quote Tesla, where, where he said, that, look, eventually the problem with science is that when you just do calculation after calculation on top of each other without the each one looking at the preceding work down to the foundation by the time you get to the top it's mostly meaningless you know and so that's that's my stance look i i didn't want to believe this nobody in the flat earth community nobody thinks it's a good idea everybody hates it just like you do but it's and, and everyone tries to debunk it but the more you look into it in fact if you like the globe don't if you're listening to this don't look into it do not go down this rabbit hole i'm telling you because once you start pulling threads there is no end to it to where eventually like you just said eventually you're going to have an answer for everything and well, look, I, I, said, I said mark I've, I've been i've been looking at this for since um scott said that you were coming on the show yeah i've been really looking into it in depth okay no. I've, I've spent hours and hours every day looking into this yeah. and there's nothing on there that makes me think i mean when i was a kid maybe you know i used to think when i was a little kid i used to think that we lived is this some massive experiment that we live in some kind of ant farm you know my my, my imagination used to run wild on me you sure. know? but when you see these experiments that are done and not just experiments by nasa and all the space agencies around the world and that's a lot by the way who are in this massive collusion sure you know it's checkable data that you can do yourself when i look through a telescope i can see the stars i can see the effects of gravity and on one of one of the films i saw on the flat earth yeah. there's, there's no such thing as gravity apparently uh, yeah, I, that actually is the my yeah, that is a minority <laughs> that believe that there's there's no gravity. Although I gotta tell you, it's an interesting thought because again, I'm in the flat Earth. I can't exactly shoot it down where they say, well, if it's an enclosed pressure pressurized system, then it's density. And I was going, eh, it's not bad, but I still go with what we what we build into physics engines, which is artificial gravity. That's just what we do. So. I, I know we're we're gonna probably disagree forever on this, which is which is fine. I I expected that. Look, if if you had told me right off the bat, it's like, look, I'm into amateur astronomy. It's like, okay, well, I I know that nothing there's nothing I can do there, because you 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 want to believe it. That's the difference. You so want to believe it's in not, space. It's not a case of that. Not yeah, it is. All. Sure, it I, is. I am, I am into. It's not not at all. I am into all sorts of stuff. I don't bash anything until I've researched it. This is this is a paranormal show, all right? Mm -hmm. um, we yeah, trust me, Gary. Gary bashes the paranormal plenty. I still haven't believe get him to believe in this stuff. But he's a he's a um, a uh, you know not really a uh, skeptic, but someone that is okay. If you've got this, prove it. Yeah. Now, well, let me I'm, ask a question. Yeah. Uh, let me just intervene here for two seconds and ask one simple question. Sure. Mark. Yeah. What would it take to prove to you one way or the other? Right. What would one thing that, that could happen if, if NASA came to you and says, we're going to prove the Earth is round, let's send you to space. 
would you do it? You, of course I would. I'd, I'd jump at the chance, even if, uh, if it was at the risk of my life. But I wouldn't think it would have to take that. Because all you, what do you think it would take? All you really have to do is put a freaking 4K camera on the side of something, turn it on, do okay. not hit the stop button under any conditions, and let it go to where the Earth they, starts. They, they've done it. They've done it, Mark. And, and one of these flat Earth Really? Where, where is it? Where is it? I'm not... Now, listen to me a second. I'm not tiring, of, <laughs> tiring you all with the same brush. They, they put a, a 4K... I think it was on the side of the SpaceX rocket. And they fired it up, and you had a clear shot of the ground as it disappeared underneath you. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, you heard this sound, and it looked like a massive deceleration. And this idiot said, there you go, it's hit the dome. You know what I mean? Uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, of course, look, in, in, not, in, any community, in any community, you're going to have ground troops that are going to make some some leaps and look i appreciate the leaps of faith on their part i do if we didn't have them we wouldn't be talking but as far as the spacex thing goes come on come on the, the spacex that spacex footage was so oh my god i could talk an hour just on spacex but let me let me give you 60 seconds of it which is mm -hmm. spacex the one thing that was missing it was the the finest i will give them credit for this is the finest example of, of misdirection i've ever seen which is let's focus on the booster one landing booster two landing i don't want to even go into that crap booster three which apparently crashed in the bermuda triangle and then go to car and then you have the profile of the car flying great fantastic anyone knows what was missing the falcon rocket actually detaching the car and falling backwards this giant thing floating out of frame from three different cam camera angles from the hood and the side and the headrest you come to that conclusion just because they focused on the boosters no 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 not not just because they focused on the boosters meaning there was literally no shot of the falcon rocket detaching that car from a from a production standpoint the money shot because remember this thing supposedly splits down the middle right like, like a knife cut through it that's you you turn yep. the camera from you you go to the camera on the front of that car the thing splits beautifully it detaches it falls out the back and it would have taken minutes to do so and yet they just go to the side shot of the car and there's no falcon there's no falcon rocket it's gone it's it's okay, let, let, let's look at this very we've got about five minutes left okay um so we'll have, we'll have to cover this quick as i start to talk to you all night um We've got all these thousands of thousands of tons of stuff going up in the air, okay? Right. All these rockets since the 50s have been going up. Right. Where is this stuff going, number one? Where is all this stuff going? It's not all coming back down to Earth, so where's it going? And number two, what are all the thousands of tons of space rock that hit us every year in the form of meteorites? How are they getting through the dome? Okay, first first part. As far as any rocket, oh boy, there's so many different evidence I could go down here. As far as anything going up on the top of rockets, those just go off somewhere and crash. If you have any doubt about, I, in fact, I talked with one of SpaceX rivals. They're, they're, I got in a conference call with a guy in Germany and these guys out in California called, uh, oh boy, Interorbital. That's who they were. And because I asked him, I go, because my theory was, well, if, if anyone's sending something up in a rocket, what I would do is I would take over their telemetry and then ditch the rocket somewhere and make sure the payload also ditched somewhere and then, you know, use whatever, fake whatever transmissions I had to, to give them the data they wanted. And I said, so I asked him, I said, hey, does NASA, do you have to submit your plans to NASA before you send anything up? And they go, no, we don't. And I go, oh, that's interesting. And they said, but we do have to submit it to this other agency. And she goes, every country that has a space group program has this agency. It's the Atmospheric and Transportation Safety Bureau. And she goes that you have to submit every last freaking detail of your rocket months and months in advance before it goes up. So you know, do, do I think that rockets go up with anything on them that actually goes anywhere? No, I think they all ditch. Are there satellites up there? Probably, but I think they're suspended by uh, high altitude balloons, part of the NASA balloon projects, which started in the 1950s. You can look that up. Some wonderful videos on that. And Well, shouldn't we be able to see the balloons that they're there? You'd have thought, wouldn't you? With a telescope, I mean, should yeah. we be able to see those? Yeah, probably, probably. If you could zoom okay. in on us, if you could zoom in on a satellite, find me also pictures of satellites taken from other satellites. If you can, well, okay. I've seen a picture. I've seen, I've seen the ISS. No, 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 no. Anything from the ISS cannot be used. Cannot be used in any verification ever. 
They are they really the United States military. That's who you're going to lean on. It's like, well, the United States military would never lie to us about anything ever about anything. When I was in the military, they never lie. They don't. Uh, we're never giving you a shot in boot camp. First fucking thing, a shot. God damn it. Yeah, look, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they tell the truth. Oh, my God. But all, they... I'm, all I'm saying to you is that I have sat in my back garden with a telescope and seen the ISS, and it's fins, you know, these solar panels, it's clear as day. I'm not, I'm not saying head, there's not some... and a half thousand miles an hour. Oh, no, no, I'm saying so, there's, there's, is there something flying up there? You bet. I, I've, I've seen the videos myself. Are there people on it? Not a chance in hell. No way, no <laughs> how. There is nobody <laughs> flying around in the ISS. In, in khakis and polo shirts and socks just cruising around not having a care in the world even though a micrometeor the size of a nickel would kill them all oh, dead mark. instantly mark you correct me up right i've got to, i've got to say this right before you go um i cut loose on you a few times and you took it you've not got the um put the phone down on me <laughs> all right i've got i've got through a fraction of what i wanted to say to you <laughs> and it, it's been a pleasure to talk to you believe it or not i've got really annoyed with you all right i'll be honest and and exacerbated but i'd love to talk to you some more so if, if scott's willing we'd love to get you back on sure yeah i think it's great you know what, what what i like to do is you know we'll do some research on our part talk to some people and like to bring you back on and you know because it's an interesting it's an interesting topic you've got a lot of, of points of view on it uh, that are that people sit there and scratch their head but you know hey 50 years ago people scratch their head about a hell of a lot more things so maybe right. we're we're scratching the surface something interesting here that that you know, needs more attention i think it does and uh, you know mark if you're willing to come back on that'd be great sure and anyone that's looking at this for the first time uh by all means look up something on youtube called the flat earth shortlist for new people with, which is a collection of introductory videos to the topic, ranging from five minutes to a couple hours, and it's 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 awesome. a pretty pretty nice way to do it without having to do a lot of drugs. Okay, well, that's <laughs> even better. All right, well, Mark, we actually we blew through two hours quick, so. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. What is your website where people can uh, check you out again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just go to enclosedworld.com, uh, or you can just type into Google Flat Earth Clues, and you'll find all my stuff. And uh, but, but by all means, the community is much, much, much larger than me. Just type in Flat Earth into YouTube and uh, enjoy. There's a lot of material out okay. there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for listening tonight. And uh, Gary, who do we have on next week? Good question. We have got uh, Chris Conway. Chris from, Conway, yes, sweet. The, yes, the most haunted medium, Chris Conway, and he's, uh, he's doing lots more besides. So uh, we're going to have a good chat with Chris. Oh, great. Okay, so Mark, thank you very much. Gary, yep. thank you very much. Everybody in the chat room, thank you very much. No, check no out hard Mark's... feelings, Mark. Oh, I, no, I, but I've had worse than this. It's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, We'll see you guys next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks, everybody. Have a safe week, and everybody take care. Good night.